In the first deployment of IF1, I had it in my head, and I think a lot of us did, they're like, dude, we won, it's over. You know, there was no foreshadowing, at least at our level, that this was gonna last fucking 20 years, which is crazy to even say out loud, you know, 20 years. So I thought it was done. And then like, I'm home, loving life, go back to uh, Kansas, uh, my hometown, see my family. They're so excited that I'm back and, you know, then I go back to the Marine Corps and, oh, by the way, you're going to Fallujah in a few months, you know, you're going back and it's like, holy fuck, what's Fallujah, you know, <laughs> like what's, right, we're going back. Like, I thought like we made it to Baghdad we took out the military, it's over with like, no, nope, this is the occupying phase, you know, so, and then, then it just started continuing, you know, and deployment started coming and. Welcome to another edition to the Kit Cage, and please give a very warm welcome to Jason Lilly. How are you, Jason? I'm good, bro. I'm good. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. You are a former Marine infantryman, uh, recon, sniper, MARSOC, then joined the CIA. That is one hell of a, a resume, and I'm sure that's some serious life experience that we're going to talk about over this coming episode yeah it's uh it's been a trip my friend uh never thought i'd ever do anything like any of that to be honest with you uh you know talking to you previously right before we hit record you know it's it's uh i'm in a unique state kind of coming full circle myself kind of looking back from third person like how did i end up there and uh how did i and why did I decide to join and get out and, you know, all of it looking back, it's, it's, uh, it's been a trip. It's been a good experience and a hard experience, but here we are. Um, I, I, over the episodes that I've, I've done, I've sort of, um, got the assumption that there is a, a certain type of, uh, childhood, the operators of a certain level experience. For for some reason, there's circumstance that ends up with them being operating at a tier one level. Um, it, it's it's never that they have a a bad childhood. Some of them are good childhood, but the majority come from um, separations, separated families. Um, they're usually quite uh, sensitive, emotional, creative, and for some reason, it's that sort of character that that sort of makes a very good tier one operator um w would you surmise in saying that, that you would have fitted that character at, at, at your young age i know that you, your parents had divorced but um what about who was jason at that sort of age i mean you probably nailed it in that one paragraph to a t from what i've seen in my own perspective of other operators and specifically myself for sure you know i was a sports kid, you know, I played baseball. I, I was outside a lot. I fished. Uh, I was a band geek. You know, I played the French horns. So my parents were were big time musicians. So uh, I had this musical influence and in, in teachers uh, and my parents did separate. They did divorce. I went through three divorces by age 14. And that last one was kind of the one that broke me Uh self-esteem wise and self-perception wise and, and what led me to the military to be honest with you um what's what led me to i wanted to become tough you know i wanted to be a man i wanted to to learn how to fight and get the ladies and you know have really really get some confidence in something like earn earn something for myself right so and i love my parents to death and you know, now that I'm older, almost 44, it's, there's no guidebook to life, you know, yeah. um, there's no, I mean, there are right and wrongs, right. But there's, everyone's trying their best at the time with the tools that they have at the time. And I see that now. So I've made a lot of the same mistakes, you know, and uh, that, that's a humbling thing and a, it, a cool thing. If you look at it that way in the sense of like, wow, you know, it, it humbles you that damn, not everyone's perfect, you know, and I don't know. Um, I think if you just keep trying and 
pushing forward, you know, that's the answer is never, never stop, never quit, always drive to improve and learn and listen probably more than anything. And I still have a lot of listening to do. So I think we all do. Um, so going, going through that, you, you, you said that at that stage you wanted to be, become a man and you wanted to join the military. What was it that pointed you in the direction of the Marines rather than the, the army and why that MOS and particularly, you know, a, a Marine infantry and then choosing all those different MOSs? Yeah, man. Uh, first of all, I never thought I'd ever be in the military. You know, I, I smoked a lot of weed in high school and partied. I was very social in the sense of I was friends with everyone. And I, I, you know, I think anyone looking back that knew me at that time would have never thought I'd ever be in the military. You know, I was a super skinny kid, six foot two and probably weighed 155, 160 pounds. You blow away in the wind and, uh, a lover more than a fighter for sure. Fighting scared the shit out of me in high school. You know, I was that guy that was friends with everyone. And there was one person in my life that was a military guy. And that was my grandfather who fought in World War II, you know, and uh, like a lot of our, from the UK side to uh, the American side, that was a world war, you know, and we fought to legit adversaries at that time. And my grandfather, like a lot of our grandfathers were, didn't really have a choice. They were a part of that. And he was in the Navy. So I just had this affinity towards the military. I'd say one word, it would be respect. Um, and just, I knew it was super heavy. I knew it was almost ineffable like, to describe the stories that I heard. And honestly, a very similar experience as to what I, what we, we endured, right? But I just knew at a young age, there was just something special about it, something to respect about it. And I couldn't quite place it, but it was there. But again, I, it was so distant and so foreign, you know, and I always looked at the military as something, I don't know, out of my reach or just something I didn't want to do. And then a roommate uh, was the one that kind of brought up the military to me and specifically the Marines and specifically recon Marines. Mm -hmm. And there was one movie in particular that I watched called Clear and Present Danger. And it was kind of a bad example of recon Marines because I got fucked <laughs> up in, in this, uh, you know, there's the Hispanic guy, the Latin dude talking about it. He was like the one sole survivor, if I remember right. You know, he's been in a couple of cool 90s and early 2000s movies. He always played a tough guy. And I was just like, damn, those dudes, you know, because we all heard about the SEALs, but who is this other unit that's like six man teams going behind in enemy lines? You know, I'm like, wow, it's that. He was the one that brought it up to me. So I think that was like the the, the candle, the the wick that got lit, at least the idea. Um, and it started to become a small goal, like something I was slowly, you know, climbing towards physically now i was starting to run you know i was starting to to do some push-ups and you know the mind was starting to slowly crank into this this heartbeat into this rhythm towards that direction and uh almost joined the army and i had a recruiter take me to fort leavenworth kansas i'm from kansas originally and uh he, this is before cell phones really man this was like like pagers and shit and he like took me to this army base and like i just got a really bad taste in my mouth for the for the army man and really kind of the military in a way and this he had a page on his like you know his pager and he's like hey hang out with these young joes there's, there's like this infantry unit there training or getting getting back from training he's like go talk to these kids basically these young joes like young pfcs or whatnot and I'll go make this phone call. And as soon as I was alone with these guys, they're like, yo, dude, don't, don't fucking do it, man. It sucks. Like, and I was like, what? He's like, yeah, fucking go to college, go like hang out with chicks, man. Like, don't, this fucking sucks. And I was just like, Jesus. <laughs> you know? So it, it, it kind of scared me, man. For like two years, I didn't really do shit. And I ended up joining the Marine Corps in 2000 at the age of 20. So I had a two year kind of, you know, in America, I don't know how it is in the UK, but like 18 is when 90% of the people join, to be yeah. honest. So I had a two year break of just kind of figuring my life out and partying way too much and working dead end jobs at a young age, car washing and washing dishes and just grunt work, you know, and I'm like, fuck, if I'm going to be a grunt, might as well go into the military and 
you know, be a grunt. So um, that was that was the decision. And it wasn't like this monumental thing. It was just there was something hard about the Marine Corps that I don't know, there was just something different to it that struck struck me in a different way compared to the other branches, for sure. Going back to that that sort of two year two year gap year um that you took before joining the military. Um saying that you took those demenial jobs, those mundane jobs. Do you think that that perhaps taught you some mental resilience and perhaps, you know, put you in good stead uh, for for joining the military, for for doing your basic training rather than just going in at the age of 18? I do, man, just because I, I, I probably now in hindsight worked, you know, kind of like the some of the hardest jobs in the sense of like uh, social status. You know, it wasn't like I was, you know, this kick-ass salesman you know driving a bentley or something you know and like had the gift of gab you know i was like literally washing dishes in the back of a shitty restaurant you know and i had these dreams of then they were so distanced I, I didn't know what my future looked like and just literally hour by hour listening to heavy metal i was a metal guy like you know kind of angry at the world in a lot of ways but i didn't know how the fuck i was gonna get out of this situation but i just kept doing it you know, and honestly, I felt so out of place for the longest time. And, and in, in hindsight, you know, a lot of Marines and service members do kind of feel out of place to some degree. And uh, I think that is kind of some of the human condition. But I, I noticed in the Marines, you know, once I got in there, I was like, damn, a lot of these guys grew up very similar to I did. And like these kind of misfits that all kind of came together. And, uh, we, you know, became an extended part of my family for sure. So, yeah, they all led up to it, dude, because I went through some hardships of like having a dollar in my pocket and eating. You know, we got these gas stations here called Quick Trip in the Midwest and East Coast called QT, Quick Trip. And I buy one fucking sandwich and that was my meal for the day, you know, and like. I was 18, 19. My parents had a bunch of kids and were split up and I didn't, I had too much pride to ask them for fucking help at that time, you know, and I was pretty much kicked out anyway, because I was, you know, a troublemaker and staying out way too late. So, you know, during that time frame anyway. So, uh, yeah, dude, it all gave me some, you know, some leather on the skin, at least. I would say it wasn't rock bottom. It was fucking kind of close to it, you know, and yeah. I'm like fuck, dude. If I can go through all this, like anything's gonna be better than this, right? Living in a a party apartment with like two other dudes and not really ever getting any sleep. And I was like, dude, I'm out of here. So yeah, uh, I would say, yeah, it definitely led to the Marine Corps and mindset. Going through uh, your basic training, who was your um male role model who did you look up to the most during that time period i'd say you know in the marine corps it's 13 weeks of boot camp um and for the most part the drill instructors are are they're pogues you know they're not combatant fighters they're not infantrymen they're not recon dudes we usually kind of just stay in our own realm for the most part and randoms come into the di field but in boot camp i had some drill instructors that were were cool but there was one that sticks out and it's funny you even ask this because there's one i would still like to talk to to this day his name was staff sergeant i think rosado a light-skinned hispanic guy r-o-s-a-d-o <clears throat> excuse me r-o-s-a-d-o and he was a stud man he was a little skinny the dude could run like the fucking wind but like he was hard as fuck too man he just he was tough but he was I don't know, man, there was something about him, but I like looked up to this dude and literally did everything he fucking said to a T, you know, I didn't want to like disappoint this dude. So if I could talk to that guy now, I'd like to talk to him. So, yeah. Um, moving forward, you, at what point did you choose your specialization then? Cause obviously, uh, going from Marine infantry, you, you could branch off in several directions. Why, uh or, or how did you put paperwork into to go towards recon and sniper right right so to me the the meat potatoes the heartbeat of the marine corps is the infantryman you know yeah. 311 is you are the guy carrying a shield and a sword you know 
for the king and the queen, for the president. It's the same shit. Yeah. The titles change over the years, but you are the fucking basic soldier. And that is, that's square one. That's fucking letter A, you know? And, and I'm so glad I chose the grunt route first. Um, but I could back it up even further when I was going through at the time called SOI, a school of infantry. There were guys trying out for recon at the time, but I was so overwhelmed at just being a fucking basic Marine and just learning how to fucking tie my boots and like survive and like not get my teeth kicked in, you know, just, just, just do the job, just learning. Cause it was such a culture shock, as you know, coming from the streets to this, this, this military, you know, this military might. So I would say I did a deployment in 2002. So I joined in 2000 and in 2002, I went to Okinawa, Japan as an infantryman with third battalion, fifth Marines, very famous battalion that went to Fallujah in 04. Mm -hmm. And it was about that time on that deployment, six month deployment to Okinawa that I had stopped kind of smoking. I had stopped drinking a lot. You know, as a young guy, 20, 19 to 21, we all drank, fuck, as you know, way too fucking much. I want to do it all over again, probably, but uh, save my money a little bit more. But uh, yeah, I started running a lot, man, and found out I was actually really good at running. Um, and I loved swimming, too. So the recon side is heavy in the amphibious side. Um, so I started swimming my ass off. And, you know, swimming with bricks out of the water, training for this. I got out before the Internet was giant. So I started learning about recon and I'm like, I'm going to fucking try out for it. So we had a tryout in Okinawa, Japan in 2002 on that deployment. And it was a full day event. You know, there was a mental attitude test, basically, you know, to see you already did the test. I did a look and see if your, you know, your, your scores were X, Y and Z. And luckily mine was by the skin of my teeth. And uh physically i gave it my all plus 22 you're, you're pretty young don't you're not banged up like we are now <laughs> so uh yeah man that was the side where i decided to part way and all my boys in my platoon were, were pretty fucking supportive i had one that told me i wasn't gonna make it though i remember he was an older dude named sergeant hutton and i thank him to this day to be honest he was that guy's like you'll never make it lily my last name's lily he's like you'll never make it lily and i dude i fucking use that for everything you know, fuck you. I'm going to do this. So do you, do you think that's why he said it? Just to give you that extra bit of fuck you. No, motivation? no, fuck no, not. no, he meant it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he meant it, dude. He was this big old, I mean, giant. Do you look like a character off a of video game, man? You know, and I think every platoon and every service member has the story of this like kind of big ogre fucking dude. And he just, he was you know, he was a scrapper for sure. Not a dude I ever want. I mean, he was old as fuck too. To me at that age, he might've been fucking 30 when I was like 22 and, you know, he was married, he lived off base and he was just mean as shit. So, but I, I, I don't know. It was a challenge, you know, him telling me that I couldn't do it. So, and I started using all these failures in my life as like momentum and, and, and some pain and anger that I had inside of me to use as fuel to crush at least push myself to the fucking max. So uh, he was a voice in my head that was definitely there for a long time, especially at that time. So uh, at this stage, then, what would be the biggest differences between you uh, as your younger iteration, you know, um, creative, uh, sensitive, scared of a fight, to how you are now uh, at, at this age? What would be the biggest differences you would uh, recollect between my current self and old self i would say that's a tough question man um i'm not as emotional uh in the sense of maybe i'm as as emotional but i the ability to control it's just part of becoming an older man is just the ability to control control your emotions and to when you feel those same emotions, be able to reel it back in, you know, as I start to feel my anger and temper or sadness or even happiness to reel it back to center, you know, like before it was fucking zero to a hundred fucking quick. And, you know, I was like throwing a temper tra tantrum as a kid, you know, like just fucking loud and banging shit around just, just to bring attention to the situation and how you're feeling. It's like, just, just, 
you know, an expression of this, this mess of feelings that you have in your head and your heart. But now it's, it's, I feel more of a pause, you know what I'm saying? And, and I want to feel that I want to think things through more. I didn't do that then, you know, it was real quick and kind of dramatic, you know, as we were as young men. So now it's, it's just, you know, like I said, I'm 43 now, you know, it's just, I would say controlling myself a lot better and the things that I say a lot more. What was your first com, um, combat deployment because obviously Okinawa training deployment so I would imagine you would be going to the Middle East for your first combat deployment what was yeah. going through your mind uh, as you were heading to that first kinetic deployment you know uh excited um I was now at recon at this point I just left uh the uh basic reconnaissance course at the time I think it's still I think it's actually called RTC, but at the time it's called BRC, uh, which was in uh, Coronado, California, Camp Pendleton, the second half. And you, you trained for it, man. So it was like, you know, as in UK language, you know, like it was the football team training, you know, for, for the playoffs. And I finally got to go to the fucking real game. You know, this is it. We made it to the NFL. So this is no shit. So I definitely had some fear, uh, but that fear keeps you hyper vigilant, awake, and aware. This isn't a joke. This is this makes you perform better because I think if you went in there lazy and complacent, you're going to get yourself or someone else killed or, or delayed reaction. I should say when you need to react quickly. So yeah, I would say just just surreal. You know, like we grew up on. Rambo platoon video games and movies and TV shows and books and holy fuck. Like this is my generation. Like this is our war. This is our Vietnam. You know, this is my grandfather's world war two. I'm going, I'm invading another fucking country. Like this is crazy, you know, with the military might, you know? So it was, I mean, it was chaotic. It was boring. It was, exciting you know depends on the hour really so yeah i mean pretty pretty surreal to be honest especially at a young age i was 23 do you think you were mentally prepared at that age to experience that it's a really good question uh i don't think so comparatively how i am now i think i would be a lot more methodical and a lot more resilient potentially now yeah. um because you know i've been to japan and a few other countries at that point but going to iraq at 23 uh i don't know I, I i felt like i didn't have much control over a lot of the situations and that is true but i think now i don't know i'd just be a little bit more aware and awake and not so tunnel vision as I was then. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like geospatial, like, like I was so focused on just like my sector for lack of better words. So now I think I would be as an older guy, just more receptive to conversations that I'm hearing, especially from higher ups, from, from superiors. I'd be more involved in such a lot of ways too. I'd probably a better, I'd be a better teammate for sure. Um, to be honest with you. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, 23, 18, 19, 20, it's all kind of the same age. It's a young age, you know? So, yeah. What was the, what was the first experience in Iraq that probably put you on the back foot thinking, you know, you've had the excitement of, you know, this is what you've been trained to do. You, you've gone into country. Like you said, you've heard your grandfather's stories. Like you said, you were living it. But what was your first experience that took you back and thinking, shit, this is real. Something could seriously go wrong. Well, I mean, it was portrayed in the HBO miniseries, Man and Generation Kill. So it was Nazaria was the first time. So we crossed the border in the back, uh, excuse me, in Iraq on the way up to Baghdad. And Nazaria was the first town that I saw any combat. And we didn't get into a lot of it, but I mean, it was the first time that there was an enemy 
the whole fucking way up there, at least where we were at, was pretty fucking boring. And then we get there, started hearing artillery, started seeing Cobra, started seeing Huey, started seeing explosions at night under night vision goggles, you know. But the first time I heard a snap of a real round snap by me and break the sound barrier was the first time that I became awake. Um, and awake in the sense of, I think it was just, you're so fueled with testosterone and invincibility at a young age. That was the first time that I was like, holy fuck, there is another human being that wants to end me. An unknown face, an unknown men, group of men, an unknown man that wants to end my fucking individual life. And like, I'm not ready to die. So some people I think at that moment would cower. I didn't cower, but it was the first time that I, I just realized like, dude, I'm ready to fucking fight. And I'm also like, holy shit, I'm only 23. Yeah. You know, it was, it, it, I realized how short life was in that one fucking moment. That one day was just like, holy shit, it could all be over. And I haven't done anything that I truly want to do. I want to make it out of this situation. One, two, I want to make it home. Three, I would like to do X, Y, and Z for the rest of my life. And it could be over now. And also realize, damn, I've wasted a lot of time. <laughs> Even at 23, I'm like, fuck, I really had it really good back home in a lot of ways, even though it was hard in its own ways, but it's all relative to time and place and your mindset at the time. But, you know, I realized like, damn, there's a Walmart and a grocery store and a fucking, you know, so much ease of living, especially in a first world country in America. And damn, this is like, <laughs> this is it. This is, could be it. This could be the last day. Do you so, think that, do you think that realization um, at that age, at that moment, do you think that aged you yes. quite significantly just at that right moment, just hearing that snap of the 762 shot past you, do you think that was an aging process that was just personified on you right there and then? 100%. 100%. And I think, you know, we hear people talk about near-death experiences. I watch all these documentaries and we see all these interviews with other people, right? But like, it's you just realize it could be over so fast and I, I don't have really any control over my life at this point. Like it's, I got my little section. I can only do X, Y, and Z. And it's like, you kind of have to let, it's almost like that, you know, old samurai mindset, dude, you almost have to fight like you're dead. And I've yeah. already heard this before at this point from famous Rudy Reyes, you know, he's a little older than I was. And it's true. You kind of have to let it all go. And like, it's almost like this Zen like approach to being in that moment. You have to kind of go by minute by minute, five minutes by five minutes, hour by hour, and just be thankful that you're fucking still breathing breath by breath. Like it's, it's, you know, you can only do so much. So um, you just kind of let a lot of it go and just, just you're hyper aware, hyper vigilant. And you're so in that moment things do start to slow down and, and you start to see everything, you know, it's like limitless in a sense. And obviously there's like a lot of chemical releases going on, but you're, you're, you're awake. I mean, truly awake because your life, it could be, you could be asleep permanently soon. So yeah, it definitely aged me, man. And it, it made me, you know, it made me a lot of different things. So, but it definitely made me more, I don't know, in a unique way and in, 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 on the back end of things, I think it made me value life a lot more too. I think um, the, the way I, I was told it was once you realize you're already dead, then you can become a soldier. Yep. It's, it, it's strange. It's you, you're doing it without the fear of what might happen to you. You're doing it for the job for the person next to you. Uh, yeah. Once you've got the realization that you're already dead, then you can, do your job as a soldier. Um, yeah, you mentioned the documentary there. Um, have Have you sat down and watched it yourself? I went to. There was a couple of uh, premieres. There was one on Camp Pendleton, you know, in California, the yeah. uh, military base. And I went to that one, and there was the Hollywood one, which I didn't go to. But I went to the one uh, at the the base theater 
um and some of the actors were there the guy that played me was not um but there were some others there so i got to watch i think they only played one episode i believe so and still to this day it's pretty surreal i grew up on hbo um you know it's pretty surreal that there was a movie made you know a seven part series about my guys about us myself and us 23 guys you know so it's uh it's still pretty surreal um to be honest with you but i've never watched the whole thing <laughs> i still haven't because when they've done obviously series like band of brothers uh pacific and then you yeah know, to, to have one done so quickly about you know our generation fighting the war it must it must have been so surreal and I'm sure I've read somewhere that did you actually try out to play yourself in the in the series, but actually got turned down? Yeah, yeah, man. And if that if that tells you anything <laughs> about Hollywood, you know, I'm not hateful. I was a little butthurt about it, but it's like you think you just show up, be like, "Yo, it's me," you know, like I. <laughs> I mean, it's not like it was a significant part in the movie, right? In the sense of. Uh, I don't know. We're all equals in a platoon. And, you know, they're like, you got your mom and your dad, you know, you got your platoon sergeant, and your team leader and shit, but like everyone's kind of doing a very similar equal piece of the pie for the most part and cover it down where the other one's lacking and vice versa. So I don't know. I didn't think you'd show up and breathe and be like, Hey, I'm Jason. Damn. You sound just like him. Yeah. I'm, I'm fucking, I'm him. So didn't get my fucking part. Uh, but the, the people there were actually sweethearts. They took care of me. So and even that experience was pretty fucking fun. I got to meet the uh, producer and the director. So, and I've since become friends with Kellen who actually did play me and he's actually wow. one, one hell of a guy. So yeah, good dude. And he's got a brother or two, I think two brothers that are Marines as well. Surprising. Oh, wow. So there's a good connection there for the, there the is. That yeah. that's really good. Yeah. He's a cool cat. Coming home uh, after your first deployment, how was that for you? Um, going from you know that kinetic environment, experiencing that, having that age-defining moment in a in a third world country, and then suddenly coming home to a first world country, you know the the thought process that must be going through your head, still being hyper vigilant, perhaps um, you know not quite believing everything you've been through. What was that experience for you? I've always been pretty good at like compartmentalizing like a lot of us. Uh, so I was able to, to really flip a switch and let my guard down for the most part, I would say overall one, I was really fucking excited to come back to California <laughs> and just come home, Yeah, you know, and the first, the invasion, the first deployment OIF one I had it in my head, and I think a lot of us did. They're like, dude, we won. It's over. You know, there was no foreshadowing, at least at our level, that this was going to last fucking 20 years, which is crazy to even say out loud, you know, 20 years. So I thought it was done. And then, like, I'm home, loving life, go back to uh, Kansas, uh, my hometown, see my family. They're so excited that I'm back. And you know, then I go back to the Marine Corps and, oh, by the way, you're going to Fallujah in a few months, you know, you're going back and it's like, holy fuck, what's Fallujah, you know, <laughs> like what's, right, we're going back. Like, I thought like we made it to Baghdad we took out the military. It's over with like, yeah. nope, this is the occupying phase, you know? So, and then, then it just started continuing, you know, and deployment started coming and coming and coming and, you know, I liked, dude, it's, it's a high, it's an endurance, excuse me. It's a extreme sport. You know, there's no other sport. And, and I think it's Kipling that said it, if I remember right, but there's no greater thrill basically than the hunting of another human being hunting of yeah. man. And there is some truth to that. Cause there's, you know, death defying sports, you know, there's, I've surfed big waves, you know, I've, I've done some crazy shit and they get you going. Right. But it's, it's, you start living through a lot of these firefights, you really do get used to this hyper intense moment, moment. And then you come back home and then you're in line at the grocery store, you know, and it's just like, you know, the Kardashians are fucking jacking their job about clothes and gossip. And then I'm just like, you know, I started 
that was like as bad as real as you can get, you know, there's just something about it. Then you come back here, like things are really slow. So it's real easy to get addicted to the feeling of like living through a fight and going kinetic and then coming back. Then there's that lull. It's an ebb and a flow. And, and you really get used to that, uh, that dopamine, those endorphin hit too, of, of going through that, that hypervigilance, that adrenaline fucking surge. There is a natural drug your body's producing. And then it fucking boom, you get back to base and you pass the fuck out. You know, you're, you're wiped out obviously, because you've been like on meth basically for fucking days and uh that your own body's producing and then now it's over you know and then you go back home you know and you're excited to go home for sure but you know it's it's uh it's a fucking wild ride man it's 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 a wild ride do you do you think um a lot of people probably struggle coming back from that environment where you're so hyper vigilant and you you're almost craving that chaos of a firefight to come back home to be stood in Walmart doing your your grocery shopping. Do you think, you know, perhaps a lot of people probably struggled with that and actually found destructive behaviors to try and get that same sort of feeling while they were back home? Yeah, and maybe not even purposefully, but like subliminally and like just yeah. kind of somehow end up in that position. And, you know, I'll speak frankly about it, but I think the drinking definitely helps you get into these positions that aren't good. You know, Yeah. you, we drink so much and I'm not anti-alcohol. I'm not, I'm not anti-smoking weed. I don't do it, but if that's your thing, cool. But it's like anything too much sex, too much water, too much fucking chocolate, too much of anything is a bad fucking thing. You got to find a fucking balance yeah. and being sober. Most of the time, I think is the best way to handle the stress of all of it. Um. yeah man I, I 100% I think most of us do at different levels Um, whether it be just kind of disconnecting emotionally or not having I like to sum it up to you do enough of it man especially it's a male trait in general like I think it's the older you get you know you're, you become a man of, of fewer words and it's somewhat harder for you to express Sometimes I think it's even hard for me to understand what feelings I'm feeling, yet let let alone express those feelings yeah. and feeling safe to express those feelings. And who the fuck am I going to express those to? Probably one of my boys, but to a significant other, you know, I don't know. It, it's sometimes it's kind of tough being a dude, you know, like it's it's uh, especially with our our backgrounds. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 uh, real easy for us to get trapped in our heads you know, and, and days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months of isolation in a sense. And you could even be around other people, but just isolation in the sense of opening up about X, Y, and Z. So, and having the ability to, to open up and, and the strength to let your guard down and to feel safe to talk about some of these things, right? And not to feel uh, weak about it. Right. And that's, that's, that's the perception that we're always trying to, you know, I said this a while back, like I wanted to get tough. I wanted to wear the armor. I wanted to be short and steel short. And I can't even talk dude. sword and shield, you know, form the wall. You know, we've watched all the fucking movies, Vikings, gladiators, you know, and now it's like, yeah, I got tough, but now it's like, I, I need to like take this fucking armor off. Like, and like be soft again, be gentle again, be, kind again i mean kind more than anything you know like it's so easy for me to fucking in my head anyway like you know someone cuts me off and on in a vehicle or yeah it's so easy for me to fucking like really feel that fucking anger you know and that that temper you know and that's what i was saying earlier it's it's i'm better now at checking that and like harnessing it but I think a lot of us fucking feel that, man. It's once you go barbaric, truly, you know, stones, sticks, hatchets, swords, they're all the same. You're still ending in life. Once you go that route and you do this taboo societal thing that you're not supposed to do, it's against the law. You can't murder anybody. But, oh, by the way, for the king and the queen and the president, you can do it. Go, go do this fucking thing. <laughs> yeah. Your, your religion says don't do it. And then you can do it now. 
and then you come back but don't do it to anyone else you know i don't want to do it anymore obviously either but like dude it's kind of hard to come back it's like a pit bull or a lion that's been wild or whatnot now you got them in a fucking cage in a way you know it's it's i don't want to say you're a time bomb but dude you're you're an animal that's got some scars you've seen some shit so that's the challenge that's the challenge is is keeping that dam back and, and locking that key away to that bear with teeth that's got like one eye and scars on his face and you know keep him asleep like make that bear hibernate you know so i think the the only way we can truly do that is if we you know drop the stigma of the the alpha male environment that that we've come from that you that you know the uh has forged you into that creature um uh, and be able to talk about it not just with you know the people that was there and experienced the same perspective of that moment with us but also with our loved ones because i you know I, I do believe that coming back and locking yourself away mentally and verbally from from our partners i think that's why a lot of marriages failed uh with veterans returning back or you know just coming back from deployments why a lot of the marriages failed a lot of relationships failed um and i think that's got a lot to blame for it but so i think opening up and talking about these things um is definitely a big step forward yeah 100 percent, man um and putting time into yourself like like really putting time into you know expect for myself as an example like i'm really trying to like do things that i actually love like i dude i googled dude i'm not gonna lie man i googled how to love myself at two o'clock in the morning one night back in california with my dog in my bed like how to love yourself like what is that even because like, like historically for me without going down this sad story about past relationships with me that i've all i messed up every one of them to be honest with you and i could say that now because i don't ever want to do it again but it's keeping people at distance, right? Let them yeah. all the way in until about arm's length. And then now that you're there, like, I'm afraid to let you in this far because I don't know what else. I don't know what that looks like for me. Yeah. So just taking the time to, like, explore yourself and, like, like, what is it I actually like to do? Like, what the word love. I mean, truly, we'll talk about it, man. Like, I've been really trying to to, to lead in love my life and lead with my heart for the first time in my life and that's sad at 43 but hey i'm glad i'm doing it fucking now and, and not be fearful like where it takes me like what be kind to fucking people help strangers out man like i really want to live the second part of my life like giving more than i've took taken i reset it so you know it's 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 sad it's taken this long for me as an individual to get to this point but i'm glad i'm on at least there now you know and at least open and i've got an ear and an eye open towards it so um valuing friendships and and learning from other fucking people right but i think that makes you a better i think we're protectors like guys like you and i like like we want to help we want to protect we want to do the right thing we want to help those in need and i still want that's still me you know um so it's a fine it's a fine line. I think of, I don't want to be complacent, you know, like I don't want to be weak in the sense of someone's going to take advantage of me physically in a moment, say at a gas station and try to rob me. And I'm just like, uh, you know, like I'm still going to smash you if I need to. But I, I think there's a trap in this like alpha mentality, like you said too. you know, it's like, you can't be a robot. You can't be hard all the fucking time. You know, like like there, there's moments of where you need to turn it on and turn it off. So it's kind of like that bear analogy. Like I'm trying to have it off most of the time, but the chest, the armor. You know that movie with Mel Gibson, The Patriot. Yeah. You know the the fucking you know <laughs> the red coats were uh, were there in his backyard, man, and he didn't want to fucking fight. He fought previously, but he went back to his fucking chest and he broke out his fucking musket and his hatchet and, you know, the armor basically. And like, I, I know where it's at. 
it's not too far behind me, you know, and if I need to grab it, I fucking will, but I hope I never have to again. So, but I don't know. The world's still pretty fucking crazy. So, especially in 2023, no, wrong. Especially, especially really close to where you're at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're a stone's throw away from the uh, the mess from the mess in uh, Ukraine and Eastern Europe, and uh, having Russian bears poke our uh, air defenses around the UK is it it's worrying times. But like like you say, you know, my shield and armor is incredibly close to me and i'm ready to use it if necessary yeah i think my trap is i was trying to live so much mentally at least internally in that mindset of just being tough and like aggressive all the fucking time and that's an angry too um because in the military i think we use anger as like fuel in a way like i use the term like you can't fight happy like fighting and happy truly don't fucking go together. You know, like even if like I save some fucking kid and from this predator dude or something, right? And I have to fucking smash this guy to death. Like, I don't really want to do that. I will. And I'll feel proud that I did it later to protect this kid, but it's fucking sad it even got to that fucking point. So that's where I'm at now. It's trying to live balanced, happy, chill until it's time to turn the light switch on and hope it stays off for a while. <laughs> um, now, obviously behind you've got uh savage actual, which is yeah. um, become your sort of podcast, your uh, half of it. Where did the inspiration for that come from? Uh, my buddy, uh, co-host Patrick Moultrip, he is a primary intern, Navy Swick. He was a boat guy for the NSW and it was really him and his wife found like a, there was a calling for two special operations veterans for a reaction video series to video games with a YouTube uh, channel called Gameology. And that's where it was like, Hey dude, you still living up in LA? And I'm like, nah, I just moved to San Diego. I'm back in San Diego. Cause I was in LA for like a year He's like, well, shit, I got this thing. It's like one day, it's like six different videos that pay X amount for this day. You want to come up here and jack your job out video games? And I'm a video gamer. So I was just like, fuck it, let's do it. And we did it. And that was kind of the inspiration. And definitely he took the reins on that. I'll give him all the credit. Like, yo, we should do this ourselves. We could do something similar and, and different. And he tried, tried, tried for like a month. Like, you know, basically begging me. He's like, dude, come on, let's fucking do this. And said finally yeah let's do it and then you know very quickly it got to where it is now so it's uh it's been a fun ride man do you feel that you know that's helped you personally from from doing that you know yeah because i get to talk to guys like you you know like and i mean that humbly man and honorably like like i've met a lot of cool fucking people and was sponsored by black rifle and had their support for vid and we've met some really interesting people, man. And it's given me time to think about some things too. And I've watched some of the videos of myself speak, which is kind of a weird thing to do to watch yourself speak. So it's forced me to think a lot more about what I'm going to say. Um, and, and how I'm going to live as well, you know? So, uh, yeah, man, it, it's been, it's been cool. And we've got some big ideas and, you know, I, I've always been a gamer. So, uh yeah, one day I hope to create my own game and we're getting into the airsoft realm, which is kind of weird and new. Um, and I'm looking at it strictly, you know, uh, as fun. And I used to talk a lot of shit about it, but it actually is pretty fun. And you're outdoors, you're off the couch and shooting each other with little BBs, you know, like you gotta go home, you know, it doesn't have to be for a political reason. You just go, it's like tag, you know, with BBs. So it's it's actually pretty fun. Do you think that that um, also helps stem the craving for that chaos of a gunfight like we were talking about earlier, doing that sort of um, airsoft military simulation? Do you find it is, if you got some of your, you know, your comrades in and in you were doing it, do you think it would be that? Or is, is it very much uh, civilians coming in just wanting a taste of, of you know, what what you lived? You know, I think it's, how do I say this, man? 
I don't get a fix from doing okay. I mean, I grew up playing like a lot of the young boy stuff, right? Like in the sense of like hide and seek. I loved it. We did it like a group of fucking neighborhood kids. I've been doing it for a long time at night, especially hide and seek was so fun. It's just hiding and finding and hunting and it all kind of goes together. So it kind of checks that box of like moving from a point to a point without getting attacked and getting the drop on them. So it does like give me a fix to some degree of that. But it's fun and it's 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 harmless for the most part. You know, it's like I'm not ending a life. It's like I'm putting a welt on a guy's face or shooting a dude in the fucking in the chest. And it does hurt a little bit. I'm not going to fucking lie, man. Dude, like that would have hit me in the teeth. That would have knocked my tooth out. So it's like that thread of getting like zinged by a good one. Right. Like it's it's there. So it's. You know, it, it's fun at the end of the day. So I'm not doing it to like kind of relive moments overseas because I'm pretty fucking over like 99% of that. So at least, especially the political view that I have about it all now without going down that fucking road. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, I mean, it's, we could speak about it, right? Because we're the guy that chose to do it. You know, I, I wasn't some dude that, watched it and like think i have an opinion your opinion is valid right but like we were the guys in the arena right you know that famous quote like the blood the sweat and the tears like i chose to fucking do it i chose to be the grunt i chose to pick up the sword and i did and i could speak about it but i could speak about my individual experience and not the collective as a sense because each guy collectively has his own experience but there are similarities with each so you know i did the invasion. I did Fallujah. I went to Afghanistan, State Department, uh, CIA. You know, I basically hung it all up in like 2016, and I still do some pretty random stuff. But you know, I was in Kurdistan, northern Iraq, for a long time, and fell in love with the Kurds there, and saw the influence of Iran and Turkey and fucking ISIS. I'm like what a fucking mess, dude. So. Yeah, man, I'm I'm at that point now, dude. Like, if a war kicked off, I think I might just go to a fucking island and go surf and like eat fish and fucking chill out, man. Like, it's 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 once the bear gets awake again, you know, it's going to be hard to quiet that creature again. So, you know, the current state's pretty fucking crazy, man. I mean, truly. Um, I want to use this section. So, would you would you say a lot of your listeners are, are there in the UK? um 50 50 uh looking through the demographic of of spotify and youtube uh the majority are us by about five percent and then it's uk and then it's separated after that so yeah Yeah. the biggest listeners are probably usa and then uk so we just interviewed dean stott sbs guy who's fucking amazing um i've hung out with a lot of brits over the years and I fucking love you guys, man. Like you guys, uh, you have an amazing culture, and obviously, like a lot of my lineage is tied back to the old days in England. And um, so there's always been this respect, I think, towards England that I've had individually for sure. But also knowing that you guys, and I mean, you as the military, supported us and went overseas and got some with us. Um, the older I've gotten, the more I've realized in comparison how a soldier, uh, a military member in the UK gets treated governmentally compared to us, like from the veter- Veterans Administration here. And it's a complete fucking travesty that you guys don't have a veteran, a VA like we do. And then you guys aren't getting a pension for PTSD mm-hmm. or a fucking ailment. It's fucking mind boggling. Yeah. Like it, like I don't want to fight really anymore. But like that cost to me fighting for you guys in a sense, my voice at least, however small it is, like it's fucked up, dude. Like and it really bothers me to hear veterans like yourself not get taken care of the way we do here. And I think it's kind of shit here. I mean, I do. It could be a lot better, but you guys don't have a goddamn thing comparably. Am I wrong in this? Or no. Is- I- you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I 
do my podcast is to try and raise the awareness of veterans in the UK to the standard of the veterans in the US because I admire a veteran foundations, veteran startups that are happening in the US, how the veteran community look after each other. Uh, even, you know, the VA is as much as it is given negative views by some of the veterans that I've spoken to, it still provides a service. Yes, they try and paint everybody with the with the same paintbrush of, you know, you have PTSD, you have depression without actually going into root causes of, of finding things. But right. again, there there is a service, service there. And you've you got people like Marcus Capone who's doing uh, vets, you know, uh, exploring uh, hallucinogenics, um, ayahuasca to, to help with TBIs and, and, and mental illnesses, uh, warrior hearts healing. Yep. Um, and, and then you've got uh, veteran companies like Eagles and Angels, I've got a few of the hats behind me that, you know, uh, almost turn veterans into a form of celebrity with, you know, celebrating their accomplishments, selling part of their uniform in a hat that you can own. Uh, and then most of that money goes to a charity. You know, it it's incredible what the US and what the US veterans are doing. And, you know, I really want to bring that to the UK. I think my, my ultimate goal would be to uh, set up a, a charity where we could send British veterans to vets in America to, you know, um, Marcus and, you know, send them down yes. that uh, send them down that route for healing because you know like you say once you leave the military in the uk it seems to be the door slams behind you and that's it and that just seems to be the way it has been it's really mind-boggling to me because you know i don't even i feel bad for even asking this but it's for the most part it's still a volunteer service for you correct correct it hasn't been um service um mandatory service since the 1950s i think 1950s they they finished um service uh I don't know, national service that's what they call it national service and then uh yeah it's finished it is all voluntary it's people you know 18 year old kids thinking yeah i want to join the military i want a, a career in a career in that and they they sign up and uh yeah yeah it's you know talking to dean the other day you know a little bit about this and you know my other brothers from the uk it's like it's 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 crazy man because it's it to me as an outsider it's kind of your recruiting aspect you know it's really hard to recruit young guys to join the organization to join the military knowing that on the back end there's not going to be if i get fucked up which the chance physically more than anything yeah. Like there's not going to really be really any support on the back end. So that that's kind of scary. So there's got to be, and you nailed it on the head, dude. I've thought so many times of how we could raise money collectively, you know, and really team up to send, you know, 20, 30 guys that were together in a platoon over here and do something with fishing or hunting, you know, an ayahuasca DMT. I've done DMT. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it was a life changing event for me for two years, two years ago, excuse me. So uh, there's a lot of avenues for growth and like betterment, and it's something needs to be done. You know, and now more than ever, the ease of communication and the internet, like there's got to be, you know, there's the broad listening base out there collectively between the US and the UK. Like there's got to be people out there with some power and money to like, you know, kind of grassroots start taking care of your your countrymen that have decided to join, you know, for the empire, for lack of better words. You know, there's got to be. Uh, there's there, there are a couple of um, charities in the UK that do sort of help veterans. But again, after speaking to other British veterans, they, they have incredibly negative views about them. Uh, I, I know of one that is actually really, really, really good, uh, which is called Pilgrim Bandits. Uh, and they actually raise money to help um, veterans who are amputees live life to the full. So they might be sending them to um, climb Mount Everest. Um, 
Wow. And I think yes. they've, they've, they've literally just sent the, the first double amputee to go up Mount Everest as well. So I, I know Pilgrim Bandits do do a lot for that respect. But when it comes to actually perhaps a, a medical side and with TBIs and PTS and depression, then I don't think there's that much that is available in the UK. I tell you what's helped out, helped me out a lot is physical fitness yep. and making that a priority. You know, I've got a triathlon coming up July 9th. Um, it's kicking my ass, you know, training for it again. I'm not in my 20s, I'm not running as fast yeah. as I used to, but having goals, you know, setting the goals, following through with them, staying busy, staying for the most part pretty fucking sober. Uh, and honestly, physical fucking fitness, PT, man, has, I've noticed a big decline in mental health with friends and family that just like get off of that yeah. and be becoming an inside dog, you know, and like not doing things anymore. You know, you got to stay active, like whatever it is, like whatever gives you joy, if it's football, if it's archery, if it's fucking reading a book, it's something, I mean, I'm fuck reading a book, like it's something physical. Yeah. You know, that that is honest, pure, you know, endorphins and dopamine hits that are that are that are real, you know, and you can repeat that you know, over and over. And it's 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 a good thing. So I don't know. I think that's been my saving fucking grace for sure is physical fitness. So I wish more veterans would could hear that and and, and try that. I mean, do it for fucking six months and I guarantee it after six months of hitting it hard, you're going to feel fucking great. You'd be like, ah, he's right. You know? So, and then most of those guys know it to be true in the heart. I mean, especially if you're an older guy now, like an older veteran, like, dude, remember how you were physically in your fucking twenties. Like that's attainable still Yeah. with diet, with fucking sleep, you know, sober fucking sleep, you know, contacting your boys, get your boys together, go do something together. You know, we just had a reunion in Montana and a lot of us from Generation Kill were there. It was a recon wow. reunion. So um, it was it was amazing. There was 38 of us there. A lot of those guys I hadn't seen since 20, 2003 and four. So um, I don't know, man. I, I wish I could help you out on that, dude. I don't know how that even looks. But I know, I it would be something else. I'd have to work on in the future. I don't know where, I don't know how my, myself, how it would look at the moment, but it, it is my pipe dream to, to set something up like that. Yeah. Something's got to be done. Plus it give me a reason to come to England. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so where, where, sorry, where, where are you at right now, man? Uh, I'm on the uh, East coast, um, a place called Lincolnshire. So I'm okay. uh, literally, if I went outside, I could probably throw a stone and hit the beach. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, not warm water. Uh, it's not been too bad today. It's been about 28 degrees outside. Um, okay, okay. So, it's not bad. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been fairly warm. It's been, yeah, it's been a good so far this week. Yeah. I cut you off, man. What were you going to say? Uh, I was going to say, um, I just wanted to give uh, two questions to to sort of wrap up the, uh, the interview. The first one would be, uh, what, knowledge would you impart to your younger self that was just about to go sign that contract for the marines as you sit there now what would you uh advise your younger self just before he signed that bit of paper i've got a lot of things to say one take a lot of pictures and not of yourself fuck selfies uh take pictures of your friends and family and spend a lot of time with your friends and family because in 20 years a lot of those older family members are going to be gone and you think they're going to last forever, these Christmases and Thanksgivings and holidays, reunions, birthdays, but they start disappearing quickly. Go to every wedding that you can. Go to every funeral that you can. Uh, don't let go of home. Don't let go of friends, even civilian friends that you make. Hold on to them. Um, give it 100%. Stay single. <laughs> uh, truly, I truly... I truly mean that. Stay single if you're really serious, especially on the fighting side of things, uh, whether it be soft or whether it be the infantry, stay single. Because um, that's you're taking away from your team, um, being distracted emotionally and mentally. Uh, you'll better, you'll be a better soldier. You'll be a better teammate. 
when you have that distraction gone and it affected me deeply you know i was not fully committed you know i was but i wasn't so it just should be a lot less stressful staying single um you can really focus on your job and that's what you should be doing serious job uh yeah man and have fun like really be a fucking teammate like know your guys and and be be the papa bear you know try to take care of your team you know lead lead that way lead from the front some good advice uh and my last question would be what advice would you give to somebody who is looking to transition out of the uh forces who's looking to you know leave and join civilian life what would be your advice to them take a walk about get out if you're gonna get out go solo like go on a fucking trip or maybe you and a boy and go travel the fucking world i'm not not for the king and the queen not for america not for the government go travel the fucking world you know go to asia go to fucking vietnam go to go somewhere third world for the most part go to Europe, I don't know, go somewhere and just go take a fucking walk about for a month. You earned it and go do some soul searching and hiking and eat some cool food and then come back, you know? And, uh, yeah, but, but kind of come up with a plan and it's going to change, you know, like you don't have to figure it out in one day. If you don't have a fucking plan when you get out, Hey, you made it out. It's like prison. It's an institution. They're going to find your way. And there's going to be ups and downs. It's not going to be easy, but nothing is. So, I mean, it makes those moments even sweeter when they are good. So, but take it serious, you know, and I don't know. Just just give it. Don't half-ass it. Give it 100 for sure. And catch up with some some people that were a part of your life that kind of made you who you are before the military and link back up with them. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us on this episode. Brilliant speaking to you. You've got some wonderful insights and there's a lot of things that I can relate with with what you were saying and, and also your life journey. So, yeah, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show. You've been brilliant. Of course. Thanks, man. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you very much. My name's Christian Holloway. I uh, spent a little over uh, 10 years in the military. I was in the Marine Corps. Um, spent the majority of that time in MARSOC and uh, had a few deployments um, to Iraq, um, three combat deployments, and uh, please join me on the next episode of Kit Cage.